<laughs> okay. okay, I think it's recording. Yes, thank you. Okay, sure. So, Danny, let's move on. There we go. So, the when I refer to the R22 phase out, R22 is the most commonly used refrigerant that harms the ozone layer um, in the United States. This refrigerant is still very, very widely used and in small mom and pops and small grocers, a lot of independent grocers, um, they will most likely still be using the refrigerant that is called R22. Um, Title VI of the Clean Air Act gives the EPA the statutory authority to regulate refrigerants that harm the ozone layer. Um, and uh, Title VI was based on an international treaty called the Montreal Protocol, which is considered to be the most successful environmental treaty ever in the history of the world um, globally. Um, and what is going to happen here is um, the way that the EPA has chosen to regulate this refrigerant is by what they call a phase out. And what they do is they estimate what the need for that refrigerant is in terms of millions of pounds of refrigerant. And they deliberately um, put a cap on the supply of that refrigerant. So they set production limits on a yearly basis. And then that drives the price of the refrigerant up to the point where it's no longer economically feasible for supermarkets to use that refrigerant at the rate that they tend to leak it. So you see here that as of 2020, the EPA is not allowing any of this refrigerant mm -hmm. to be produced or imported. And from 2015 to 2020, there's a linear trajectory downwards. Um, and you see the numbers in terms of the need of refrigerant versus the production limits. Um, we have already seen in 2017, I would say in 2015, the price of a pound of R22 refrigerant was probably around eight to $10. Right now in 2017, it's already up to 25 to $30 a pound. And you can expect that price to continue to go up. So um, more and more uh, companies now are getting to the point where they're finally realizing that they need to move out of using R22 into a different refrigerant that is not subject um, to these production limits. So that's the first way that the EPA <clears throat> regulates uh, the refrigeration world in terms of the grocery sector. The second way is called Section 608, and that is um, a, a regulatory framework under Title VI of the Clean Air Act. It has multiple parts, as you can see there on this wheel. Um, many of those parts um, have some consequences out in the field, like technician certification, but I'm going to skip that and I'm going to hone in on the part of Section 608 that most of the small businesses in the country um, have some problems in understanding and some problems in kind of making sense of what they have to do. So really, Section 608 for grocery stores boils down to three things. They, they must keep certain records, and the records are of their refrigerant use, um, repairs that they make, but they must, they're required in that regulation to keep certain records they have to be able to make those records available to the EPA, either when an inspector shows up on site or when the EPA issues, you know, a 114 letter or, or officially requests uh, those records. And then those records must demonstrate the proper refrigerant management practices. The vast majority of the fines that the EPA issues under Section 608 are um, for uh, they're, they're based on record keeping because really um, in order for them to find someone for, for anything else, the EPA would have to kind of be on site watching refrigerant um, being vented or something like that. Um, it's quite unlikely that they would catch anyone in the act. So they rely on all of these mandatory records to show them that the grocery store is not following proper refrigerant management practices. 
So um, this, these three bullet points are basically boiling down, I don't know how many pages in the regulations. Um, and I tried to keep it as simple as, as possible. And um, this kind of tends to work if you're talking to the regulated community out there um, in relation to Section 608. Next slide, Danny. And then finally, um, the last main way that the EPA or that the federal government regulates um, refrigerants and um, especially the supermarket industry uh, is called the SNAP program. And SNAP stands for Significant New Alternatives Policy Program. Um, and you have to be a little bit careful if you refer to SNAP with people in the grocery industry, they will assume that you are referring to um, any one of a number of different things that are more prevalent in grocery uh, stores um, that also have the acronym SNAP. But uh, really what SNAP does is when Congress passed Title VI of the Clean Air Act, they wanted to be sure that when people were moving out of refrigerants that harm the ozone layer, that they were not moving into refrigerants that were even more harmful to the environment. So the SNAP program at the EPA evaluates what are called substitute refrigerants um, for these refrigerants that harm the ozone layer, and they um, have to basically approve those refrigerants as being um, better for human health and the environment. So there's what's referred to as the SNAP list, and um, the only thing that really people in the grocery sector have to be aware of related to SNAP um, is that they are using an approved refrigerant. And the chances are not very high that they would have access to a refrigerant that, that is not approved for use. But um, just in terms of practical consequences, uh, that might be um, the context that you hear about the SNAP program in. Now, in terms of policy, uh, the SNAP program, if you can go to the next page, Danny. So the SNAP program is used as a, a heavy hitting hammer in the policy world by the EPA. So what the SNAP program has been doing slowly but surely is um, finding substitutes acceptable that are um, ever lower and lower um, potential for global warming. So they started out with the chlorofluorocarbons were phased out in the 90s. HCFCs, that is that R22 we talked about earlier, that's in the process of being phased out. The EPA is also um, in the process of trying to phase out the use of some um, substitute refrigerants that have very high global warming potential. And um, I'm not sure somehow this vanished from this slide, but they're also phasing out the medium global warming potential HFCs in many end uses. So what the EPA is trying to steer people towards as they're limiting the um, availability of the refrigerants that harm the ozone layer, they're trying to ensure that people move to a substitute refrigerant that has the lowest global warming potential possible. So next slide. And there you see the, the global warming potential comparisons. Um, so the main, um, you see there the R22 is the last um, refrigerant on here that harms the ozone layer. That is the one that they are going to get rid of by 2020. And then these other ones that are listed here um, are the ones that people are moving into. The EPA obviously does not want people to be moving into R404A and 507, which, have, um, which are about 4,000 times worse for climate, they have global warming potentials of about 4,000, and we obviously don't want them substituting one environmental disaster for another. We don't want them moving out of a refrigerant that harms the ozone layer into a refrigerant that is a disaster for, in terms of climate change. So next slide. 
Okay, and um, Danny, I don't, is this where you wanted to take over or you said slide 12 and I'm not, I don't have any slide numbers on here, so. I think this is you still want... your slide, Keely. Okay. And I'm a All couple right. more away. Okay, you, you just butt in. I'll just keep talking until you say, nope, okay, time for you to stop now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, one of the things that I think most people are not aware of, and I, I think this is very telling, is that, you know, in the supermarket industry, when people talk about uh, climate change, they, they seem to um, talk about climate change as a synonym for energy efficiency. The supermarket industry is one of the few um, industries out there where there is another source of um, an impact on climate change, and that is um, direct emissions of refrigerant. So if you look at your typical supermarket in the United States and you look at their profile of their electricity use and you look at their typical profile for refrigerant emissions, the climate impact of their refrigerant emissions on a yearly basis is actually higher than their entire annual electricity use. So anyone who calls you and says, you know, I'm interested in doing something voluntarily related to climate, um, mm. I'm not saying that you should not talk to them about changing out LED light bulbs, but, you know, you would have to change out um, billions of LED light bulbs to achieve what we could achieve just by trying to get a handle on the refrigerant leaks that they have in their stores. So you see there um, that really um, the, uh, the, the impact of the, the refrigerant leaks, you see there about 3.4 million pounds mm -hmm. of carbon dioxide um, versus about 3 million pounds of carbon dioxide for their annual electricity use, you could turn off the electricity for the whole year in a supermarket and still not equal the savings that can be achieved by um, addressing the refrigerant leaks. So the next slide. So that leads us to, you know, why are refrigerants still a problem if we have this EPA regulatory structure and policy framework in place and we've been working on this for a very, very long time, why are we still talking about refrigerant? And if you were asking yourself that question, it's a very good question to ask. Um, well, first of all, what happens is that um, the, the industry story all the way back from the 90s has been um, moving from CFCs, the chlorofluorocarbons, um, which was a very, very bad refrigerant, to something like R22, which is far from being a good refrigerant, right? So basically the EPA has been moving people from one bad refrigerant to a slightly less bad refrigerant. And as Danny's going to explain to you for the first time ever in the history of regulations for refrigerants, um, we finally do have good refrigerants that are options. Um, next, the regulations focus on leak repair rather than prevention. So in order for Section 608 regulations to go into effect, um, they only are triggered when a store has a refrigerant leak. And if your regulatory framework only goes into effect once you have leaked refrigerant, well, you are never going to get to zero leaks. The whole purpose of the regulatory framework is not to get to zero leaks because it only kicks in once you actually leak refrigerant. So for the first time ever, we actually have proof um, that there are technologies out there that prevent all refrigerant leaks. And they actually solve this problem um, rather than addressing it from a leak repair side, they are addressing it from a prevention side. And finally, um, I, I'll just uh, stop there and actually hand over um, to Danny, as I'm conscious of the time here. Thanks, Keely. Sure. Um, so next, we'll look at the fundamentals of natural refrigerants. As, as Keely mentioned, you know, this is the first time in history where we actually have a good uh, we have a good alternative, a good replacement solution 
that exist today. So, you know, firstly, what are we talking about when we talk about natural refrigerants? Uh, we today are talking about ammonia, uh, carbon dioxide, and various hydrocarbons, but mostly when we're talking about hydrocarbons, we're talking about propane. Air and water are also considered natural refrigerants, but we aren't focusing those on those too much uh, here today. So in terms of their application to commercial refrigeration systems and, and uh, uh, what you would commonly see in a supermarket or convenience store today, natural refrigerants are really relevant for all aspects of commercial refrigeration. So we've mainly seen uh, movement in remote refrigeration systems, which are also referred to as a rack. Uh, this is a system you would typically find in a store that has multiple case lineups, uh, walk-in coolers and freezers that are all running uh, you know, to a central compressor system, a machine room. Uh, there's also potential in smaller store formats. So if you go into a typical convenience store, you might just see you know, a single condensing unit that's servicing uh, one case lineup or a walk-in box. And then uh, most recently, and there's, there's really a lot of excitement and eagerness to explore this area, uh, is self-contained units. And here we're talking about a, a unit that just uh, plugs in and you know, doesn't need to run to any kind of remote condensing unit or system. It's self-contained. And right now, a, a typical supermarket might have 10 or so of these units. And, and maybe in a smaller convenience store, you might find one or two. Uh, but there is discussion about the idea of replacing a remote system or a condensing unit uh, system with, a self, with all self-contained cases. And uh, we would call this a self-contained system. I'll get into that a little bit more later on in the presentation. Uh, in terms of types of uh, installations, so naturals are, are also relevant for new, new equipment, uh, new store construction. And several stores are also exploring the idea of replacing existing equipment, especially uh, old equipment that still uses R22, and with the phase out driving up the prices of R22, as Keely mentioned earlier, people are really looking to get out of R22, and instead of uh, retrofitting to a refrigerant that would be later phased out in the future, they're choosing to replace their existing equipment with a natural system. Uh, one area where naturals are not ideal is in a retrofit. So if you have an existing system that's using a HFC refrigerant, um, because of natural, ref natural refrigerants are very different in nature, you can't just pull out the refrigerant and replace it with ammonia or CO2 or propane. Uh, the changes to the system that are required are, are so extensive, really you have to replace the entire system to make it work with natural refrigerants. And so for a remote system, I'm talking about replacing a case lineup, uh, the refrigerant piping, the compressors, condensers, really everything needs to be replaced. Uh, so looking first at ammonia, uh, this is actually the, the most efficient refrigerant that exists today. And it's been in use since the very start of when refrigeration was uh, first invented. It's mostly used in industrial applications. Uh, majority of industrial applications use ammonia, uh, but it's very easily adaptable to supermarkets and remote systems is where we will see it most often. Uh, as I mentioned, it's very efficient and a little bit goes a long way. So we're talking about in a system that would normally use a few thousand pounds of refrigerant, being able to reduce it to a few hundred or even less. Uh, and that's because it is such an effective refrigerant. Uh, it's also exempt from Section 608, which makes it attractive from a compliance standpoint. Uh, however, there are a, a couple of barriers. So 
because the majority of applications have been in the industrial sector, uh, equipment that is manufactured is geared towards these larger, more expensive systems that are just way oversized for what a, a supermarket might need. So manufacturers are starting to look into making equipment that is sized correctly for commercial applications, but it will take some time for that new equipment to enter the marketplace and reach the economies of scale to help uh, drop that initial high price of, that we see with new technologies. Codes and standards also need to be adapted for refrigerator or commercial applications. Right now, the majority of them are addressing industrial applications. And then finally, uh, you know, public perception. When people think about ammonia, they think about the toxicity. And in reality, it's been used, uh, you know, for hundreds of years and been tried and tested in every way possible. Uh, next, looking at carbon dioxide. So uh, similar to ammonia, this you know, it's very easily adapted to or, you know, applicable to uh, commercial systems. It does operate at a higher pressure than traditional systems. Uh, but other than that, it's very similar to the existing HFC-based systems, remote systems that are currently in grocery stores today. Uh, it's also very efficient and really so far it's, it's shown to be uh, more efficient than HFCs in northern climates, and there's what we call the north-south divide, where uh, this type of system, a CO2 transcritical system, operates efficiently where the average ambient temperature is lower, lower overall. Uh, and then once you get to higher ambient temperatures, like in the southern part of the United States, you know, anywhere where the average uh, or the, the ambient temperature is above 87 degrees, there starts to be uh, energy penalties for running these systems. But uh, there are new technologies coming out that will make these systems more efficient, even in warmer climates. And some of those are, are getting installed even just a few months ago. And so we're all, as an industry, looking towards that data to, to prove once and for, for all that you know, CO2 can operate efficiently uh, you know, no matter where it's located. Uh, there's also higher initial costs, and I'll get to some of the reasons for that in a little bit. Uh, and finally, hydrocarbons. So here we're talking mostly about propane, and the primary application has been in self-contained cases. Uh, propane is flammable, as you all know. Uh, most of you have used propane to uh, light a barbecue or a camp stove, light it on fire. And uh, this has been a real barrier from the codes and standards perspective, and uh, I'll get to that also in a little bit. Uh, but propane is already in use at the store. Uh, you know, at a grocery store, it, it's used for heating, it's used for cooking and baking, uh, and, and supermarkets actually sell more products with propane than will ever be present in a refrigeration system. So it's really a question of reframing people's thoughts and perceptions. There is also the potential for uh, self-contained cases using propane to change the, the fundamental landscape of the store uh, refrigeration system. Uh, in the past, you know, supermarkets have chosen to install remote systems uh, because of the, of the efficiency gains associated. Uh, but now, with the current advances in technology, it is potentially more efficient to have an entire store full of self-contained cases uh, and, and really remove the need for a remote system or a rack altogether. Uh, additionally, self-contained systems, as we call them, uh, offer other advantages. They can be flexible in terms of merchandising and position and placement in the store. It's as easy as plugging it into a new outlet. There's also lower installation costs and maintenance costs uh, associated with these units. And even the ability to use the, the heat rejected from these units to actually heat the entire store. So there's really a lot of potential for self-contained system and a lot of um, 
you know, uh, new tests and trials going on today. Uh, just to give you a, a visual here on how much propane is needed for these self-contained units. So uh, a typical vending machine or beverage merchandiser contains the equivalent of a Bic lighter, which you'll find in your uh, checkout stand. Uh, and a whole case lineup contains the same as a typical, you know, Coleman camping stove container, which you'll find in a number of grocery stores. There'll be, you know, over you know, 40 or 50 of those units sitting on the shelf ready to be picked up. So uh, also in terms of energy efficiency, uh, the, the test results I have here in the table were actually uh, done by Target a few years back that looked at comparing several beverage merchandisers using uh, various refrigerants and testing the energy performance. Uh, they found that propane has a 53% energy reduction over using our uh, 134A. So just to give you an idea here of the, the potential energy savings that could be seen from these self-contained systems. So we've reviewed uh, all of these benefits here. So uh, natural refrigerants are more energy efficient in, or can be more energy efficient. Uh, they offer greenhouse gas reductions, both direct and indirect. Uh, indirect from the energy efficiency and direct from the, the refrigerant leaked. They are exempt from section 608, which effectively makes them future proof in terms of future legislation or regulations, and uh, really helps to eliminate the constant phase out, um, the pressure that grocers are dealing with today and trying to make the right decision uh, in order to invest in their future. You know, if they invest in natural refrigerants, they are, it's one thing they can cross off their list and not have to worry about. Uh, but so why aren't natural refrigerants more prevalent then? Uh, there are many different barriers to adoption, but the, the three that I'm going to focus on and you know, the three that NASRC has prioritized um, because of their impact and, and ability to really uh, change the future of natural refrigerants, you know, the, the first is cost. And cost, when I'm talking about cost here, I'm, I'm talking about multiple facets. This includes the, the first cost of equipment and all the components needed for a natural system, uh, the refrigerant itself, which oftentimes uh, there's a premium for supermarkets to store a full charge because their local distributor does not carry the right type of natural refrigerant on hand. There's also the cost of installation and the experience level of the contractor who uh, you know, maybe doing this project for the first time and has to account for all of those unknowns in their installation bid. So uh, the question around cost is really what will it take to build the economies of scale? And, you know, while we're seeing that many end users are waiting for prices to come down uh, before making that initial investment, we know that the prices can't come down until demand increases. So, you know, that's something that needs to be worked on simultaneously. Uh, there's also the barrier of service and training. So here we're talking about service readiness. Uh, and just like cost, there's really a catch-22 that in order for a contractor to invest their time and their technician's time in training, uh, there has to first be a demand. And even those that, you know, may have made the initial investment and trained their, gone ahead and trained their service technicians, uh, they may not have a really good way to identify themselves and connect with end users that are looking for uh, this type of service. And so they'll, the end users will assume there isn't anybody trained and they won't choose uh, to install a natural refrigerant system. And then finally, there's codes and standards. So uh, here, this isn't really, this isn't just safety standards or engineering standards, but we're also talking about codes at the local building level, um, fire codes that often have outdated provisions and don't support uh, or don't allow these new technologies to be installed. So this is a, a slow process it will take to update all of these, but 
you know, a very necessary one in moving forward. Uh, so these challenges that I just talked about, none of them are new. Uh, these are challenges that have been talked about in the industry for, you know, a long time. And uh, really what spurred the founding of the NASRC was that uh, a group of stakeholders from the supermarket refrigeration community uh, decided it was time to stop talking about these challenges and wanted to really do something about them. So they got together and uh, took action. And, you know, that action is really, really builds the, the foundation of our organization. Uh, so we're an environmental 501c nonprofit. And our mission is to create a more sustainable future by really addressing some of these barriers that are preventing the adoption of natural refrigerants. So the way that we've aligned our organization is really around these three major hurdles, so cost, uh, service tech readiness, and codes and standards. And the work we do to address these hurdles is primarily done by our progress groups that have um, you know, core focus areas that fall under these three main hurdles. So we've got a group that works on return on investment and taking some of that you know, cost data and trying to analyze you know, where is it that we're seeing a high cost of components? You know, why is it that, that customers are having to pay for the offsite storage of refrigerants? Um, you know, what can we do to uh, help contractors really jump ahead on that first project and be able to um, take out some of those unknown factors and provide a more reasonable bid. Uh, we have a, a group focused on utilities and energy efficiency. So here it's to you know, rec get recognition for the energy efficiency benefits that uh, oh. natural refrigerants oh. have. Okay. And working with utilities not only to get those benefits recognized, but also uh, receive incentives in exchange for installing them. We've also got a group that's focused on service yeah. contractors and technicians and, you know, trying to resolve the problem of connecting experienced contractors with end users looking for their service uh, and also making sure that there's standardized training and certifications available around natural refrigerants. Uh, and finally, codes and standards, you know, again, working with engineering safety standards, we have a number of partners in this area that we're working with, uh, all the way down to the local building code level. Turn the water on, too. Uh, and the work we do, we do this through the work of our members, so all of our members uh, participate, you know, in, in one way or another in supporting the work that we do. Uh, we have members that include end users, and, you know, that's, that's both national national companies or companies that have chains, chain locations, and then down to the small uh, independent and regional uh, organizations. We've got service contractors uh, and consultants, utilities, uh, design and engineering firms, and then product manufacturers to do this work with us together. Okay, and so, uh, like I mentioned, you know, one of the core areas that we're engaged in doing work, making progress, is to identify funding mechanisms for natural refrigerants. And um, a little bit of feedback. I don't know if someone's having a... There aren't any shelves in there, so you can just push it. Is there a way to mute that person, maybe? Yeah. Okay. Oh. All right. Well, I'll just keep going. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so, I'm trying to, I can't figure out who it is. Um, so sorry about okay. that. No worries. That's the no worries. Uh, so What's up? The, uh, there are, um, as you are all aware, the What's supplemental up? environmental What's projects, up? which <laughs> currently we're working on one in the state of California <laughs> that hopefully will bring uh, some funding to self-contained uh, right. cases. Like I mentioned, there's also utility incentives. So from on that side, there's both. Uh, we're looking at that from the the custom, uh, you know, system perspective, and also the the deemed uh, or prescriptive uh, widget based measures. So we're working with a coalition of utilities to uh, on both of those approaches, uh, and we also worked with 
SMUD, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, in the development of their pilot program uh, that I'm going to cover here in a little bit more detail. So SMUD has launched a, a natural refrigerant incentive pilot program that's really uh, building off their existing uh, incentives for energy efficiency on the custom side and adding an incentive for direct greenhouse gas emission reduction. Uh, and this, this pilot, I should mention, it's exclusive to natural refrigerants. So, you know, they have not included HFO blends or other low GWP uh, refrigerants. It's, it's really meant to promote uh, natural refrigerants. And uh, there's also a, an additional bonus incentive available for small businesses that are located in, in disadvantaged communities. Uh, so some of the details around that, just to give you a, a sense of the program, uh, on the energy uh, efficiency side, which is based on their existing custom program, pays out uh, $0.10 cents per kWh, $200 per kW, and that's capped at $150,000 per project. On the direct greenhouse gas emissions reduction side, that's uh, set at $25 per metric ton of CO2 equivalent emissions reduced. Uh, and 25% bonus for small businesses located in disadvantaged communities, and up to that, that is capped at up to 30% of the project cost, or 150,000, whichever is less. And the combined incentive from both the energy side and the greenhouse gas reduction is limited to 50% of the project cost, or $250,000, whichever is less. Uh, and I can just tell you that, you know, we know from, from our membership base that there are uh, a few end users that are looking into applying for this as well, um, and, and that's for their system. So they're, they're looking to build a new store, potentially, to take advantage of this pilot. Uh, and then we also have end users that are looking to use this uh, to replace their self-contained cases. So um, it'll be, uh, you know, really interesting to see and follow the progress of this pilot. And, you know, our hope is that, uh, you know, its success can inspire other utilities to uh, adopt similar programs. Danielle, can I interrupt for one second? This is this is Jenna. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, but, you know, my understanding was that um, this the small business incentive actually, but I may be mistaken. Um, it was just for small business, and it didn't have the caveat of of, of um, being located in a disadvantaged community. You know, I, I thought so too. And then after reading their uh, their brochure a little bit more in depth, it appears that it it does have to be located in a disadvantaged community. Uh, but I'm happy to clarify, you know, that that's just how I read it. And I'm, I will distribute uh, their flyers to everybody if you want to read more. And, and I can get them to clarify that question in writing. Okay, super. Or, or I can talk to Ryan, too. Great. Okay. Um, so then, you know, we want to open it up for some questions here. Uh, I have provided our contact information for both NASRC and for SMUD. And like I said, I'll, I'll provide some of that uh, program literature on the SMUD program for your reference. Uh, we would be really interested to get your feedback on our presentation today and to hear if there are any topics related to natural refrigerants that we could cover in further detail in the future. So I'll be asking Brent to send out a, a link to a brief survey to get your feedback on that and uh, in exchange we'll provide a, a copy of today's presentation. So, any questions? Thanks Danielle, this is Brent. Um, there is a bit of discussion on the safety of some of these um, alternative refrigerants, but how does, I mean, I, how does this, their, that safety compare to that the safety of traditional refrigerants. Are there safety concerns with those as well that um, people just don't really think about because they've always used them? Or, so, you know, I'll, like with the I'll, propane or the ammonia? Sure. So I'll take a first stab at that and then I'll, I'll let Keely add any other context. So, um, you know, yes and no. There are 
traditional HFC refrigerants are non-toxic and non-flammable, so there's not the same uh, concerns, you know, that apply to ammonia or propane. Uh, but I, I will say that the equipment that's been UL approved to use propane or use ammonia, it means that it's been approved, um, you know, the, the, the safety of that equipment uh, is approved for use. So, you know, it's, it's important that we have that, um, you know, that standard that, got, that uh, covers those safety concerns. And I think when it comes to actually using it in a store, it's, it's not so much about the actual safety. It's about the perceived um, safety, if that makes sense. Keely, what would you yeah. say to add to that? Yeah, I, I think basically um, your, your standard refrigerants um, are, also have safety concerns. It's just that they have been in use now for about five decades and, and everybody um, knows how to use them. So unfortunately there are every year people who, um, who die <coughs> from using regular refrigerants because there's not appropriate ventilation and, and the refrigerant um, replaces the you know, the oxygen in an enclosed space um, and also regular refrigerants, there's an issue with um, with huffing um, that the refrigerants are um, sold illegally to kids who are trying to get high by um, inhaling the refrigerant. <coughs> Nobody talks about those again because um, everybody is, is used to dealing with them. Um, the main point to understand about um, ammonia is that the ammonia units, the only part of the supermarket refrigeration system that has ammonia is actually on the roof. So the ammonia never enters into the, into the store. <coughs> it's actually a, a different refrigerant that is circulating throughout the entire store. Um, and in terms of uh, the use of propane, um, there are over, uh, in, in fact, so let's put it this way. Um, there are more propane home refrigerators in use in the world um, than there are refrigerators without propane. So in other countries in the world, um, propane has been used in these amounts um, successfully for uh, decades. It's just the U.S. that is a little behind the times. Um, in fact, in terms of natural refrigerants, we're definitely what you would call a developing nation and in fact, many of the developing nations out there are much farther along in the use of natural refrigerants. Um, they do not have the codes and standards and UL safety. Um, <coughs> sorry, I just got a cough to correspond with, with me needing to talk here. So I apologize for that. But, um, you know, if, if people can use ammonia and propane safely in, you know, Bangladesh, Nigeria, um, Bolivia, um, I, I definitely have full faith um, that we will be able to use it here intelligently. Um, and let's not forget that every um, idiot in the United States can use a 20 pound propane container in their backyard for a barbecue grill. They don't have to pass any kind of certification exam in order to handle that. And um, the purpose of that is to light it on fire. Um, the purpose in a refrigeration system is, of course, not to light it on fire. So we just have to kind of reframe. Um, we have been using regular refrigerants for many, many decades. We've only been using natural refrigerants um, for the past four years and only on a broader scale for really the past 12 months. So it's going to take some getting used to, but they are very over-designed to the point where the safety standards um, uh, in employed in the equipment um, are are kind of up to six or seven layers of redundancy in terms of safety to make sure that we prevent anything from happening. So that may have been a long-winded answer um, to your question, but I, I wanted to be sure that everybody um, understands that because it's often the first uh, question that comes from people who are unfamiliar with these refrigerants, they'll say, well, aren't these refrigerants dangerous? Well, no, thank you. I think that answered perfectly that it's pretty much just perception. Um, 
this is Donovan Greenwood with Tennessee. Um, we were talking about fairly small amounts on most of these uh, supermarket refrigerants. Uh, could you speak on a little bit larger systems like uh, with meat processing plants, uh, I was called and they have about a 3,000 pound ammonia system. So it sounds like a large industrial scale. And also, how might this relate to Section 609 uh, refrigerants? So Section 609 refrigerants are related to um, automobiles, automobile air conditioning. Um, and really, the only refrigerant that is in use in the world um, in automobiles, in some countries, uh, they use propane in their automobile air conditioning um, the main, uh, of course, people say, well, you don't necessarily want anything flammable um, in your car. Uh, and then you point to the fact that, you know, you've got 15 to 20 gallons of, of, of another type of hydrocarbon, you know, that is making your car run. Um, but um, even more prevalently, um, people are starting to use carbon dioxide in their air conditioning systems. Uh, we haven't seen that very much in the U.S. because there is a different uh, substitute. It's called a hydrofluoroolefant manufactured by DuPont and Honeywell, um, which has a very low global warming potential. And um, that is being manufactured. I, I believe almost all new cars are um, using that alternative chemical refrigerant. And... Um, and I, I, I believe um, most of the car manufacturers jumped on board with that very, very early on because they can actually use um, that to offset some of their gasoline emissions in terms of the, um, uh, the, the new uh, standards for automobiles. And, and I'm not the expert there, but there is some kind of an incentive that allows them um, to uh, use the fact that they have an environmentally friendly or refrigerant in their favor when they're um, overall getting their automobiles evaluated for their climate impact. But, it, you know, this is, uh, our expertise is more in supermarkets and in food retail. And um, the, the meat manufacturing facilities that you spoke of, I mean, actually 3,000 pounds of ammonia is, is a very, very, very small uh, manufacturing facility. You're in, that would be what we call industrial uh, manufacturing. And about 95% of the industrial manufacturing centers already use ammonia. So they are already using a um, refrigerant that has no impact on climate and no impact on the ozone layer. So that's why we don't focus on them because they are already doing the right thing. Um, the movement there has been to move from um, a regular ammonia system, which often uses 80,000 to 100,000 pounds of ammonia to what is called a um, low charge ammonia system. If they can get their refrigerant charge down below 10,000 pounds, they can avoid a lot of the OSHA regulations that are mandatory for your regular ammonia industrial food um, facilities. Did this that answer your question? Uh, yes, uh, especially about the industrial scale. Um, and as far as the automotive, would that be a one, two, three, four YF? Um, I, yes. I had a okay. Yeah, that yeah, definitely an has a, yeah, definitely has a much lower greenhouse potential. Exactly. Yes, it also has some. Um, so the issue there, there is a report that has been issued by Greenpeace. Um, that uh, suggests that we may have some problems with that about 10 years, 15 years down the road. So um, when that substance is emitted into the air um, and it, it combines with moisture in the air, um, Greenpeace studies have suggested that it, it forms um, hydrofluoric acid, which then when it comes down, it may be um, risky for our waterways and um, for animal life in our in our waterways. 
So no one has really studied that yet, and we don't, we are not seeing the effects of that, and we will not see the effects of that probably for a decade or so. Um, and as with many of the other chemical refrigerants that were supposed to solve this problem ever since 1990, they themselves have become issues um, in the future, and they themselves then have been regulated. So um, with naturals, you know, they, they, the whole world has experience with them ever since the 1920s and the the properties and the environmental effects are very 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 well known um with these other substances they're not and you know we're not anti hfos or anything like that it's just something to keep in mind because we have been through this cycle now several times where there was a new chemical refrigerant brought onto the market um, that was supposed to be perfect, and it, it turned out to be less than perfect. Keely, this is Jenna and, and um, from California. I wanted to thank um, both of both you and Danielle for presenting to us. And I, um, I wanted to um, just talk about your trade association a little bit more, and, and you did mention um, you know who you're made up, and I, I wanted to emphasize that that what the benefit that um, that so in California our agency has been working with with your trade association for quite a while now, and what's great about I'm going to give you a little plug. What's great about you guys is that you're you're made up of lots of different organizations or lots of different. Uh, members, which include, you know, equipment manufacturers, as well as um, utilities and service providers. And so you're not just, you know, homogeneous. And that has been, you know, really benefit to our agency on a couple fronts. Um, and I mean, one is that we've used your expertise internally on a regulatory side. We've also used you on our ombudsman side. And one of your members helped us um, do a training um, video to help, you know, primarily focus on small businesses who may not have the money to hire someone or may not know what leak detection is. So. Um, source refrigeration did that. The other thing um, that I've been working on with Danielle most recently, and which you mentioned in your presentation, was the supplemental environmental um, project. And basically, for people, um, for manufacturers who aren't, who basically have an enforcement issue um, with our regs, we're trying to, um, or you're trying to come up with. Um, uh, a SEP so that it would it would help small businesses um, who can or cannot be in who don't have to be in disadvantaged communities and so um, instead of just paying the enforcement penalty well then they they may be able to the idea would be they may be able to give a portion of their money to a small business who can then implement um, you know, uh, natural refrigerants in either, you know, a standalone case or um, in, a, in in other type of equipment. So, I mean, I, I think that there's an excellent um, opportunity to think of how us as small business providers and ombuds, ombuds people can really work with your group. Um, one is, you know, is the training that you put on today. The second one is um, that it, that I know that you guys work closely with utilities and um, and oftentimes there's um, you know utilities at least here in California are looking to partner with small businesses and and provide energy efficiency um, incentives so um, if we can you know that that's a way to help you know leverage that relationship and because you're national and we're national it's it's a really great fit so that's that's another way to think about it the third way is that you know you are very familiar um, your, your organization is very familiar with with larger um, markets who have already implemented the natural refrigerants and so for people who are not in California there are there are natural um, refrigerant installations throughout the nation and so you're the perfect contact for us for for people who are out of California to you know if you're interested in visiting this type of equipment in your state chances are that there is something close by to you or in your state and you can direct um, our members to to resources so I think that that's that's a good synergy as well 
and then you also have um, you know just resources on your website that are that are really invaluable so there's there's so many different ways that you can partner with us besides you know the, the training that we that you did today and I and um, you guys are so approachable and just have a uh, great attitude and and so much information I really uh, highly um, recommend that that everybody you know contact contact Kiwi and, and Danielle um, if you have any questions and and see how they can you know help you really work with your small business um, if you have any markets in your neighborhood because we we have done that out of our office and it's it's been a great partnership thank you Jenna. thank you yeah <laughs> Thanks, Jenna, for... Jenna, we, um, we have to hire you as our PR person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and thanks, Jenna, for throwing out how you guys have worked with with this group um, for the others to, to consider. Um, I will send con the contact information for both Danielle and Kylie in the, um, in the, the meeting minutes. So um, unless they feel otherwise, uh, feel free to reach out to them if you... Uh,